And finally, onto the programme for this afternoon, I am delighted to welcome our Group Achievement Award winner for A, uh, for the Herschel Spire Instrument, led by Professor Matt Griffin, to give his talk, The Herschel Spire Instrument and Its Scientific Legacy. Over to you, Matt. Uh, thank you very much, Martin, and uh, uh, thanks for whoever it was that uh, nominated us and voted for the SPI team for, for this award. Uh, it's uh, uh, an instrument on uh, a major ESA cornerstone mission, so naturally it represents the work of hundreds or thousands of people, people in uh, universities, in scientific institutes, in industry, uh, scientists, engineers, managers, administrators, uh, the European Space Agency, uh, our participants around the world. So it's a massive team, and it's a great privilege to be able to say something ab about their uh, achievements. Uh, so Herschel was um, designed to look at the universe in uh, a, a new observation window. This diagram shows the brightness of the extragalactic night sky with three major contributions. Uh, one is the ultraviolet optical near-infrared radiation that we see, and that's just the accumulated <coughs> emission of uh, galaxies over cosmic time. And then there's the cosmic background radiation, which tells us a lot about the, the Big Bang, or was the, uh, the objective study of the Planck uh, satellite, which was launched together with Herschel. Uh, and in between, there's the far infrared bump, which was only really discovered uh, in the mid-1990s. Um, and uh, was, has been very poorly studied uh, until recent times. Uh, and that uh, uh, sort of peaks at 100 microns or a bit longer. And it's that wavelength regime that Herschel was really designed to explore uh, in a, a systematic way. Uh, the reason why this bump occurs, this, where this radiation comes from, uh, it comes largely from the reprocessing of uh, uh, higher energy processes radiation from stars embedded in clouds of gas and dust. The optical UV radiation from the stars doesn't emerge because it gets absorbed by tiny dust grains, smaller than micron, but there are a lot of them, so they blot out the light. Uh, and likewise, dust can be heated up by accretion processes, accretion onto forming stars and accretion onto the central engines of, uh, of galaxies. So accretion energy and uh, starlight from young stars is reprocessed and emerges in the far infrared. And that's why we need to look at that part of the spectrum to, uh, to study those phenomena. <clears throat> so that's what Herschel was designed for. It was the fourth cornerstone mission of the ESA science program. Uh, and uh, here's a, a diagram of the satellite, uh, a telescope, a Cassegrain telescope, a sun shield to uh, protect it. The telescope is at a temperature of about uh, between 80 and 90 K. Uh, a large cryostat, a tank of liquid helium containing the scientific instruments, all of which needed to be cooled to extremely low temperature to work at all. Inside the cryostat, three uh, instruments. Uh, this one here is the Spire instrument, and the other two, Hi-Fi and Pax. I won't have time to say anything about them, but you should regard Spire as just an example. All of the three were constructed in the same kind of uh, of arrangement, uh, funding and organizational arrangement. They all did great science and, and Spire is just one, one of the three. Between the three of them, what they did was carry out uh, photometry, very sensitive uh, photometry in six bands between 70 and 500 microns, so a few hundred times longer than the wavelength of visible light. Most of that band is completely blotted out by the Earth's atmosphere and uh, most of the rest of it is very difficult to observe in. <coughs> so. Uh, photometry, cameras taking pictures, and spectrometers covering a similar range to home in on spectral line emission and features. It was launched in the middle of 2009, and because the uh, tank of helium had a limited lifetime, uh, the helium eventually ran out in, uh, uh, on April 29th, 2013, and then the mission was finished. This is the kind of... Uh, a configuration for a mission that space agencies love because they don't have to keep funding it over and over again with uh, additional extensions. Um, uh, from the scientific point of view, we knew from the start that it was going to be a limited lifetime mission, and that made, 
made it very clear that every hour of observing time was very precious. There was no, no margin, no opportunity to scratch heads while the helium boiled off at the cost of about a million euros a day. Uh, so Spire, one of those three instruments, a little bit more detail about that. It uh, took pictures at three wavelengths, 250, 350, 500 microns, all operating simultaneously, uh, again, to, to try and maximize the uh, use of the observing time. Uh, with uh, the largest field of view, 4 by 8 arc minutes, that we could possibly achieve given the limitations of, of any uh, spacecraft instrument. A lot of the maps that I'll show later on are much bigger than that, so Spire um, um, uh, implemented those maps by sort of painting the sky, moving the array back and forth uh, across the sky. Uh, and then to complement that, uh, a spectrometer, an FTS, Fourier Transform Spectrometer, uh, to study spectral line emission and the shape of the continuum over quite a broad range, 200 microns to, to 670. The detectors used for SPIRE were bolometers. They had to be cooled to 0.3K, 3, uh, 0.3 degrees above absolute zero. Uh, the helium in the tank provided a temperature of 2K, so we needed an internal cooler to get to that lower temperature. Uh, and the kind of detectors we used for SPIRE and also on the PAX instruments are bolometers. Very appropriately, uh, the mission was named after William Herschel, the discoverer of infrared radiation, and he would have no problem understanding how the detectors work because the principle is exactly the one that he used to uh, discover the infrared, uh, the, the heating effect of, of the radiation. Uh, the only fundamental difference is about a factor of 10 to the 9 in sensitivity. <laughs> So the Spire instrument, like the others on Herschel, was built by a large international consortium, uh, 18 institutes in eight countries, uh, five, uh, six in the UK, uh, listed there. So as you can imagine, it was a lot of fun uh, uh, with the consortium. It, it's always re really exciting and, and uh, satisfying working together with, with uh, people from all over the world uh, with a great sense of, of common vision and purpose, achieving something together. Um, a, a quite a large team, this is just some of them at one of our meetings. Uh, working on a project like this, it, it's really punishing and grueling. You have to maintain a, a travel schedule, attending meetings all over the place, uh, and it's really tiring and exhausting. Uh, but that's the kind of sacrifice that people who work on large international projects have to make for the benefit of scientific <laughs> progress. So here's the, here's the result of all that. Posing in the clean room with a few worshippers is the Spire focal plane unit. Uh, and inside, on one side, there's a, a, a camera uh, with uh, uh, lots of individual components. I won't go over them in detail. Uh, the detectors are here in, uh, in modules. So here's the helium-3 cooler that keeps everything uh, at uh, 0.3K at the detector end. And on the other side of that compartment is the spectrometer, uh, which was, uh, again, quite challenging and difficult to build, the first uh, of its kind flown, uh, with, again, lots of stuff. Uh, here are just some photographs of the various subsystems built. The participating institutes all contribute something, be it hardware or software, and it all has to fit together, fit together physically, conceptually, scientifically, uh, and operationally. Uh, and that's the real achievement of, uh, of a large team such as the, the one that built Spire. And then Spire and the other two instruments were uh, integrated onto the spacecraft uh, by ESA and industry. Uh, and there it is under test uh, at uh, Eztec in the Netherlands. And there's the final uh, spacecraft uh, just before it was shipped to be launched from ESA's uh, spaceport in Kourou in French Guiana. Uh, uh, then uh, shortly after launch, uh, launch was, was a, a very relaxing um, event for the Spire team because we didn't build the rocket. So we weren't familiar with all the ways it could go wrong. Um, however, we did build the instrument, so we were really worried when the instrument was switched on for the first time because uh, 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 we, we, we attended to it ourselves. Anyway, it seemed to work first time. This is the first image we saw, uh, which is a Galaxy M74. Uh, and that's only uh, after a couple of hours of data processing. And then a couple of hours later, uh, this is what it looked like. Uh, and this image told us everything we need to know about the operation of the instrument and the telescope. First of all, you can see that it's a galaxy. The telescope is in focus. We knew that already because the PAX instrument had taken a picture which looked nice and crisp. Uh, uh, we could see the structure 
uh, and we can see all of this stuff in the background, which is not noise. All of these are real sources. These are very distant galaxies, which were also the target of the most important, uh, one of the most important science programs of, uh, of Herschel and Speyer. So we were able to see all that in the, in the very first image that, that came through. Uh, just to emphasize the point I made earlier about the importance of studying the far infrared, the universe at far infrared wavelengths, uh, this picture shows two uh, perfectly ordinary galaxies which happen to be along the same line of sight. The optical picture on the left there shows a large elliptical and a spiral galaxy uh, nearby. They may or may not be associated, it doesn't make any difference. The picture on the right is an early image from Spire at 250 microns uh, of the same two objects. And you can see that uh, the spiral galaxy is uh, very prominent in the Herschel image. That's because it's forming stars, it's warming up dust and gas uh, in, in the galaxy uh, and uh, that <coughs> dust is emitting at spiral wavelengths and so we can see it nice and bright. So our detection constitutes a measurement of the star formation rate. And the elliptical galaxy is literally not there at all. Some of them emit faintly, this one not at all. Uh, and that's because the elliptical galaxy is dead as far as star formation is concerned. So uh, the far infrared and the visible tell you two different stories, and they're equally important stories, again emphasizing that you really need access to the entire electromagnetic spectrum to do modern astronomy, and that's one of the reasons why continuing uh, uh, missions in space astrophysics are going to be so important. <coughs> Here's the Andromeda Galaxy, our, our nearest neighbor grand design spiral, uh, a picture in the visible, and here's a picture taken by Spire at 250 microns, and if I flip back and forth between them, you can see that the areas that are not emitting, the dark bands in the visible image, are the ones that are emitting in the Spire image, and vice versa. So the visible image tells us where the grown-up stars are, and the uh, Herschel image tells us where the material is out of which stars uh, can form or indeed are forming today. So two very complementary pictures of the ecology of the galaxy. I'll skip over that. Here's within our own galaxy, uh, here's a nebula where you can see uh, a prominent reflection there and you can see some dark stuff trailing off to the upper right and the spire image uh, shows that very prominently, the material that's not, interstellar material that's not emitting in the visible, just blocking out background stars, is very prominent. Uh, and we can see this is the, uh, the blue is 70 micron emission, which is slightly warmer uh, on the, uh, the composite image. Most of the images that I'll show, incidentally, are combined from Pax and Spire, Pax being the, well, the, the sister instrument. And a lot of the science that comes out of Herschel involves complementary use of the data from more than one instrument. Another picture of a region uh, in the galactic plane showing some of the, the kind of structure. You can see there's a lot of um, uh, complex thermal structure, which is brought out by the, the blue, uh, red, and, uh, and yellow color coding here, with the blue being the warmest. Uh, and the morphology is quite interesting. You can see uh, objects which are protostars, like beads on a string. That was one of the most prominent features of Herschel galactic observations that the filamentary structure that you can see there pervades the interstellar medium, the molecular clouds, uh, and it's that filamentary structure that mediates and controls the formation of stars. Uh, there's another example. Uh, remember, each image, each pixel in this image, because Herschel was able to observe at five bands simultaneously, again, to maximize the efficiency of observations, uh, we have a, an SED, a spectrum for each pixel, and that's a huge scientific information content that can be used to study the structure and the sources embedded within it. Uh, here's a, another single image of the galactic plane. If you stretch the contrast to bring out the filamentary structure and then look at where the protostars, the young uh, 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 protostars of crystal cores are forming, they always tend to lie along those filaments. So that's where the star formation occurs. Uh, strangely, these filaments, I get a very surprising result from early in the mission, this filamentary structure tends to have a characteristic width of about a tenth of a parsec, regardless of its density. It's uh, covering a huge range of density. The width is always about the same. And that means that the, the, uh, the mechanism that controls the formation and uh, uh, evolution of these filaments is not really gravitational. It has to be something to do with the physics of the gas, the, the relaxation of turbulence. Uh, one of the, the key 
uh, objectives for galactic science of Spire uh, uh, and, and the, the PAX instrument was to study the, the mass distribution of stars that form in uh, molecular clouds. That's the mass distribution of stars in the galaxy, the IMF, and it turns out that the uh, distribution of core masses uh, reflects that with, with uh, uh, striking um, uh, comparability, except, of course, for an efficiency factor. The cores are more massive. Not all the material gets translated into stars, but it's typically about 20 or 30 percent. And that means that the, the mass spectrum of stars is being determined, uh, predetermined, by the, the cores from which they form. So the question is now, and it hasn't been fully uh, answered yet, is what is it that determines the mass spectrum of pre-star cores. Moving on to extragalactic science, one of the key uh, reasons why it was scientifically compelling to, to launch Herschel and to build Spire is that in the submillimeter range we have a fantastic opportunity to see the whole universe. This is a, the, uh, the far infrared thermal bump reprocessed radiation of a typical galaxy uh, which is forming stars at a high rate in the local universe, z equals 0.1. If you take that galaxy and move it further and further away to higher redshift, then it gets fainter, as you'd expect, but the expansion of the universe shifts the bump to longer wavelengths, uh, as you can see here. And if you look at the longer wavelength end of the, the spire range, where these curves start to intersect, and even a bit longer still from the ground where the ALMA uh, uh, interferometer is now operating. Bizarrely, uh, a source at redshift 5, which is looked back time more than 12 billion years, is just as bright or even brighter than a source at redshift 0.5. So you can see all the way back to the earliest stages of galaxy formation and evolution in the far infrared, which is a, a tremendous observational advantage. Um, and to, to show you what Herschel did when it came to <coughs> catapulting us from being able to observe a few objects to being able to observe many. When we started building Herschel, this was the state of the art. This is a famous picture taken with a scuba camera, which had just been installed on the James Clark Maxwell telescope in Hawaii. Uh, and uh, over the course of 20 nights of excellent observing time, it took this picture from which five sources were discovered, uh, which was a great excitement at the time, because uh, although that's not many, it's, it told us a lot about galaxy formation at high redshift. But when you've only got five objects and 100 astronomers, there's a limit to what you can do. Uh, this is one of the early observations from the science demonstration phase of Herschel, uh, with Spire detecting 7,000 galaxies in 16 hours in one observation, and a three wavelength simultaneously. So bringing the, um, the survey capabilities into something more comparable to what we were already um, able to do at, uh, at shorter wavelengths. And that has produced a, a revolution in our ability to characterize galaxy formation and evolution. And one of the ways you can do that is to slice up the data, to look, for instance, at the luminosity function uh, as it varies with redshift. If you can uh, place the galaxies at, uh, in different redshift bins, and the manner in which the luminosity function evolves, which you can see it clearly does here, so the gray represents the luminosity function, number of galaxies as a function of luminosity in the local universe. And as you push back to higher and higher redshift, you can see that the proportion of uh, uh, more highly luminous objects increases quite significantly. So the star formation rate uh, uh, is much, was much greater in the past than it is now. Here's that picture again with a few exceptional objects. Uh, uh, when you're doing statistics, uh, it's the average object that, uh, that might be of interest, but there are always a few <laughs> anomalies. These are some anomalously bright objects uh, at long wavelengths that were detected in the, uh, uh, the early field that I showed you before, and they turn out to be lensed by uh, foreground elliptical galaxies. Remember, an elliptical galaxy like this doesn't really emit very much in the far infrared, uh, but all it does, as far as we're concerned, is act as a gravitational lens amplifying the emission from a fortuitously placed uh, distant galaxy, uh, giving it an amplification factor of anything between a few and about 30, and enabling us to see much further than we would otherwise be able to do. Uh, so that pushed back the, the uh, 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 sensitivity of Herschel, allowing it to observe even more deeply into the, the, the past. 
uh, and uh, armed with that uh, uh, lensing effect, we were able to do spectroscopy, which is always it's photon starved. It's very difficult to do. Stretching sensitivity, able to do spectroscopy for galaxies at uh, up red, beyond redshift two, which was was a big surprise because we never expected to be able to do that uh, when we were designing the instrument. And uh, it's that kind of spectroscopy and follow-up from the ground that has revealed that the modality of star formation in high redshift galaxies is not, as was expected before Herschel, driven by mergers, but rather by uh, very large reservoirs of raw material in, in the galaxies. Uh, and looking at, uh, nearby at, uh, I think this is ARP220, um, at a, uh, a star-forming galaxy, this is a spectrum from the Spire FTS. You can see the continuum, and you can see a wealth of spectral features from common molecules, carbon monoxide, water, and so on in the interstellar medium, all in one go. Again, the purpose of the FTS, which is a survey spectrometer, was to be able to observe the entire wavelength at one time to gather as much data as possible, given the limited observing time that we knew we'd have. Um, so that's just a, a couple of examples of the kind of science that Herschel has done. Uh, <coughs> since launch, it has produced, uh, I think it's now over 1,400 papers. This is a diagram which the Herschel project scientist, Joran Pilbrat, loves to show because it demonstrates that his mission is outperforming all these other fantastic missions when it comes to uh, early scientific productivity. Uh, I'm not using it here to say that Herschel is any better than uh, any of those facilities because they're all, they're all great in their own way. Uh, but the point I want to make is that uh, this was as planned because uh, I think, for the, at least in, in terms of missions that I've ever had an involvement in, Herschel, right from the start, was planned to uh, have as much investment or an appropriate level of investment in the software, the data processing software, before launch so that straight out of the box we got great data that scientists could use. And it's very important for uh, an expensive science, scientific mission to do that. There's a, always a tendency to spend the money on the hardware because it's very challenging and expensive. But you don't really get value for that money unless you pay a lot of attention pre-launch to preparing the way for the data processing and providing scientists with uh, results that they can use straight away. So uh, this is my last slide. The scientific legacy of Herschel, um, um, most of it is still to be defined. The mission is now complete as far as observations are concerned, but ESA and the Scientific Instrument Consortia are still working on a post-operations program to get the data in the best possible shape. Um, the final data products will be as good as we can make them. They'll be properly documented, calibrated, and after the Instrument Consortia vanish in a puff of smoke in about 18 months, two years from now, ESA will maintain that data in their archive uh, and hopefully it'll be easy to use, easy to access, easy to interpret. And uh, future generations of astronomers will use it in conjunction with other facilities like ALMA and the SKA and the ELT and so on. Uh, and I think its, its ultimate scientific legacy will be the fact that it has allowed us, or uh, provided the basis for studying star formation and the processes that are involved in it in our own galaxy close up, where we have good angular resolution in local galaxies where we can see the global picture, and also in high redshift galaxies where we don't have the angular resolution with Herschel, but we can see the statistical properties of populations of galaxies uh, uh, on the sky and uh, over cosmic time through uh, splitting them into different uh, redshift bins. So we're beginning to see the, the overall global picture of star formation near and far in a single galaxy uh, and uh, how that uh, uh, manifests itself in terms of galaxy evolution on the, on the large scale. And I think in 20 years' time, that will probably be seen as the major scientific achievement of uh, the mission. And as I said at the beginning, it's a great privilege for me to be able to speak on behalf of the many hundreds or thousands of people who've made that possible. Thank you. So we have time for a couple of questions. Well, Donald is <coughs> Always is first off the mark. Um, could you go back to the? Uh, could you go back to the place where you went between Andromeda and <coughs> invisible and Andromeda in the uh, uh, in the uh, infrared? <coughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> uh, if you click the 
between the two as you did before, mm -hmm. uh, and you look, no, uh, that's, that's not quite right. You have one with both of them at the same place. Uh, uh, these are the two, so that's the visible one, and that's the, uh, the spire image. <coughs> Oh, and then, then this one, is that what you mean? I, I, I skipped over this. This is a three-color spire image showing a temperature gradient across the galaxy. Well, it isn't the same picture, I'm afraid, so I can't ask the question. But what, oh. what you had was something that showed something in the position of NGC 205. And it was at a, at a slightly different angle than NGC 205. Um. I'm not sure I know what you mean. This is this well, that's that's the satellite point. up to the left of Andromeda. Oh, oh that, yeah. That, this and, one, yeah. And, and when it's looked at in the far infrared, it has a slightly different angle than it does in the visible. Uh, you mean this little feature there? That's right. Yeah. What the significance of that is, I'm, I'm not <coughs> sure. Uh, these images have been um, overlaid manually, so I'm not sure if they're, ex if they're exactly co-registered, uh, nor am I sure about the internal structure of, of, of that uh, satellite galaxy. In any case, you can see it's much fainter than oh, yes, Andromeda it's itself. Much I have a much simpler technical question. You, you mentioned the lifetime of the helium. And it came to just a few days less than four years. I wonder how that compared to your design lifetime. Uh, that, it met the requirement comfortably. Uh, the instrument teams were hoping for a bit of a bonus, but you can never tell. Um, and it turned out that the margin on the lifetime wasn't as great as we would have liked, but uh, it exceeded, exceeded the design lifetime, so it was completely compatible with uh, what we were uh, you know, entitled to expect. Yeah, they always do. I was wondering by how much. We, we, we were hoping for another six months. It didn't transpire, but, but that's life. Well, let's thank, I agree. Let's thank Matt again. So our next speaker is Abigail Calzado-Diaz.